Although this program deals mainly with the elections of 1988, it can be relevant for all presidential elections concerning the Democrats. Uh, Senator Benson is, after all, the Niagara Falls of American political finance. I mean, uh, the party is going to get very rich as a result of this. One major way the U.S. sort of has lost out in international economic competition uh, is that uh, sort of the American defense budget and foreign aid policies go to regimes in the third world that essentially wipe out independent trade unions. I mean, and in effect, they hold workers' wages down, and they use the resources of the United States and often the, uh, to do it. A huge amount of the American tax problem, uh, the fiscal problem, is about how are you going to divide the costs of empire uh, in the population. And the plain facts are is that a, the, we spend a huge amount of our money and time supporting regimes in the third world that basically make it attractive for businesses from here to move. We look at the financing of the major political parties and the candidates and the economic bases of their decision making and future decision making right now on Alternative Views. Although this program was recorded in July of 1988 and mainly deals with the elections of that year, the information and insights presented by our guest certainly were not presented to you on the establishment media. We're very pleased to have with us today Thomas Ferguson who will discuss with us the 1988 election. Tom is a visiting professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts at Boston and is a professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the co-author with Joel Rogers of Right Turn, The Decline of the Democrats and the Future of American Politics. For the last several elections, Tom has been very closely focusing on the candidates, the economic interests behind them, the shifts in party alignment, and the basic developments of politics in the United States. So, Tom, we're very happy to have you with us today well, to talk about the 1988 election. Well, Just yesterday, Michael Dukakis named Lloyd Benson of Texas as his vice president designate. What does that signify for you? Well, my initial reaction, frankly, is pretty much like uh, Carter Glass's reaction when he, Al Smith was nominated on the Democratic ticket in 1928. I'm a Democrat, still, very still. Uh, I have to confess that you know your one's first look at this is to say that you know, Benson, well, he's he's not an ogre, and it's a party where there's you know presumably going to be different points of view. Where you're not going to have a political party uh, sits from the extreme right end of the party. I mean, this guy, if you look at his Senate voting record over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, while it's true, as Dukakis said when he introduced him, that uh, his civil rights record is quite reasonable, uh, nevertheless, he is consistently among the most conservative Democratic senators. Indeed, uh, one of my colleagues who's done some multi-dimensional scaling maps of Senate voting tells me the guy whom uh, Benson most strongly resembles most of the time is Sam Nunn. Now, I remember back in the old days uh, seeing uh, pictures of Benson uh, saying, by gosh, we got to drop the bomb, the A-bomb on, 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 yeah, yeah. on, uh, uh, on Korea. Question. And he also uh, won the election here by beating Ralph Yarborough for the Democratic nomination for senator. About by the only thing you can say vicious, with that, it vicious, was disgraceful. Uh, yeah. uh, McCarthyite yeah. red bait. On the <laughs> other hand, one has to note that uh, Benson... Uh, for instance, if you look at his staff in Congress, this is a subtle point, but it's true, it really reflects the political diversity in the state. You're not looking at a staff, for instance, that's monolithically conservative. Uh, Benson, particularly in the last few years, uh, you know, he tried to move along various Democratic initiatives as a response to Reagan from 86 to 88. Uh, 
he, for example, did, did make some noise, for instance, about the corporate minimum tax. Uh, and uh, he's a, he's a, look, the guy's a conservative Democrat and on things like the Contras. Uh, I mean, he's been an enthusiastic backer of the Contras, and unless you're wild about war in Central America, which I'm not, I mean, it's hard to see the point uh, why uh, anyone would further that. And yet uh, Dukakis uh, has said, no Contras, we're wiping them out. Well, we, well, we might want to explore policy. that a bit. My judgment is that both, uh, uh, you know, I'm hope this, I'll believe it when I see it. it. That policy remains to be defined, but you may get a very good index of this because it does appear that the administration is going to come back uh, with another contra aid bill. And uh, watching how Senator Benson and uh, candidate Dukakis respond to this, I think, is a very good index mm -hmm. of trying to find out what will be uh, the future. Yeah. Let's look at why um, Benson was chosen. Dukakis had several choices. Senator Benson is, after all, the Niagara Falls of American political finance. I mean, uh, the party is going to get very rich as a result of this, and there is no question uh, that it's been borne uh, in powerfully on me when I, I was doing some studies of financing in the 76 campaign, uh, and that was a campaign in which Benson ba quickly stepped out you know, sort of into the pool, swam around for a few laps, and, and then got got right back out of the pool. I mean, he didn't, he go, any for he didn't go anywhere. Right. Yeah, uh, But he certainly raised an impressive pile of cash, and what's even more impressive than just the, the, the pile of it is where it came from. I mean, it came not only from Texas, but from New York. You're dealing, and he has, after all, been a major player, and you know, now he's the chairman of the Senate Finance, Finance Committee. Committee right. yeah. This is uh, an absolutely central position in American life, and in that sense, uh, you know, he is well known to a lot of uh, well, big business interests in America. He's and known him for years. He's known and trusted and understood. Yeah. In other words, more money, more people would contribute more money with Benson in as vice president than say these other guys. I don't think there's any. Qu I, I, in retrospect, the tip-off is probably mm -hmm. when I think Robert Farmer, mm -hmm. who was has been doing the fundraising for. Uh, Dukakis said he wanted to raise more than 40 million in soft money this year. Soft money is money that's outside the Federal Election Commission uh, regulatory process. It should go or into the possibly he meant into the DNC. Although soft money is not De Democratic National Committee. Although soft money is not formally usually counted into that. At any rate, uh, everybody scoffed. Fortune magazine just said a couple of weeks ago that that was probably unrealistic. They're going to make it easy now. <laughs> they have done some systematic. Uh, campaign finance surveys pretty much uh, along the lines of the statistical appendix that we presented in our right turn. In 1984, the Democrats got smashed. I mean, they got wiped out. Uh, now, what's different about 1988, and in what way, did, how did you get from 84 to 88? Uh, now, well, you could do that you know, by tracing issues, by tracing events, uh, you know, Iran Gate and things like that. But if you look at it in sort of corporate terms, uh, what you see is this. In 84, uh, as we said in right turn, uh, and I think demonstrated in the appendix, is that the Democrats get an overwhelming percentage of their sort of big business cash out of the top of the pyramid, not total money, but out of sort of the major actors in the, in the IBM, in America. the big Fortune 500. Yeah, uh, large companies, yeah, without saying that those are all Democratic. Right. That, that's the kind of company I'm talking about. These are playing both sides? Of no, the no, 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 let me, let me just hmm. pursue this. The, the, they got a huge amount of money from uh, investment bankers and real estate. The investment hmm. banking money was very clearly directed toward the deficit. I mean, they said this, it makes perfect sense, at least on many economic theories they're known to hold, so let's assume it's true since they were saying it. Uh, and uh, then the real estate people were running, were can't, contributing. These were largely Northeast and Midwest with San Francisco and some Atlanta thrown in. Uh, these were real estate magnets who uh, were, put simply, their buildings dependent on large scale funding from the government of urban aid. That urban aid contributes one, it competes one for one with the defense budget. And so these guys were necessarily anti defense. What, what would they get in real estate? Well, that mass they get in put the simply, as somebody hmm. said to me very elegantly, uh, the uh, it's just a plain fact that if you build a large building in New York, it isn't going to pay off unless you've got mass transit. You simply can't bring enough people in unless you're planning to bring them in sort of stacked on top of each other. Plus, and, urban uh, development. The urban development grants are UDAGs, which have just disappeared. Uh, are nearly so, um, and central city funding. The question, the democratic problem expressed in sort of corporate terms is what do you do to branch out from investment bankers and real estate? Uh, and a huge amount of the campaign, I think, can be seen as efforts by people to sort of pick up a pocket, a pocket of business support to add that to that basic uh, level. 
when, when you look at what fo th that that cash financing, uh, you discover, for instance, Gephardt went very clearly to American industry, uh, which is a rarity for uh, on America for a Democratic political candidate. I mean, usually the industrial people end up in the Republican Party. It's pretty clear that the labor issue there usually keeps them divided, and it worked in the sense that it got him some initial. Uh, support. I, I wrote this up at one point uh, in the Nation briefly, and uh, you could find. I mean, Lee Iacocca, some of the car companies, uh, quite a lot of companies in uh, fairly uh, sharp competition with Japan, which is an issue one probably needs to pick up on uh, in detail in a few minutes. But for, there, you could see Gephardt got some real money from industry. Um, Gore campaigned heavily on his position, strongly identified himself with sort of the Likud party's issues on Israel. <laughs> uh, well, it's no secret that David Garth yeah. was his campaign manager and was uh, Likud's uh, media person in a recent election there. Uh, he also did a fair amount of money from defense contractors and so forth. I mean, he, you know, when a guy runs on a camp, he's the only Democratic candidate to sort of contemplate building those two aircraft carriers. You know, they were under discussion, for example. It wants to complete the sort of build-up of the Navy. Um, all of that was you know, fairly straightforward. Everybody, uh, Dukakis went to the high-tech people. Uh, that was the initial, I mean, he did a fair amount uh, of early financing from real estate and investment banking, uh, including a number of the people who were prominent in the Mondale effort. Uh, are very Dukakis. clearly, and the, chair, yeah. the chairman are senior figures in a large number of the biggest Wall Street houses. Uh, for Dukakis. Many, in some cases, those people backed Biden first, and when Biden disappeared, they went, uh, that was a, a big help to Dukakis. Yeah, Dukakis had so much more money than anybody else right. all throughout the campaign. I saw where he spent something like $27 million compared to Jesse was able to get something like $12 well, million, something like it, that. Uh, yeah, I won't vouch for that figure. Do what uh, Jackson started out with almost no money. I mean, paradoxically, the, the, the more his chances of election diminished, the more money he got. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt that that was, he got, he attracted some money because it looked like he was actually going to win. Uh, he attracted some from uh, various groups in the black community ranging from, I mean, there are now black professionals in corporations and so forth. I mean, it's no secret that, uh, I mean, the, the stuff the papers harped on endlessly, the whatever it was, 25 or 27 McDonald's franchisees that were black who gave him some cash. Uh, and he certainly got some money because of his position on the Middle East by people who disagreed with the uh, uh, the Middle East position of Gore or somebody. Uh, uh, Arabs or... Well, yeah. it's, it's often said. I don't know. I haven't seen anybody solidly research that, but there's hardly any question that some of the uh, Arab groups uh, in the United States were out uh, and fairly close to Jackson. I mean, it's right. just, you know, these everybody, this is the way the American political system works. Jackson got a third of the vote mm -hmm. uh, in the primaries, basically, uh, and it is probable that a lot of people, one would have to say enough to get 10 or 15 percent votes more, mm -hmm. probably agreed with them on most issues except the Middle East. And if you sort of start adding that and try to define that as the rock bottom uh, sort of liberal democratic with a small l, uh, majority uh, in the party. You come close to at least half the party is prepared to sort of swallow a huge amount uh, of the program that Jackson took place. I mean, there are serious differences on the Middle East. We, this we know, and we don't need any uh, sort of basic lectures on it. But uh, you look at that, and you wonder how you're going to win an election with, let's, let's say, half the electorate at least probably is in is basically demanding a much more uh, expansive uh, economic policy more than, than Dukakis. Yeah, more with, with a small L, because there's right. there's no question, as, as I think the Dukakis mm -hmm. campaign has realized, mm -hmm. and they've done very well on this, mm -hmm. is if you ask people, do you like liberalism, only about 20% of the pop with a big L, mm -hmm. about 20% of the population will say yes, uh, and the rest will describe themselves as moderates. Ask if they like yes, do you like the programs? Do you want to go well, to war? Uh, you know, <laughs> do you want to cut the defense? Budget. I mean, take for example uh, the question. Uh, well, all right. Let's let's let me just finish the thought on Dukakis, okay. and then we'll just go sort of through the electoral, uh, the sort of polling evidence here, and sort of where the party's at. I mean, the problem is, is that it's conceivable. There have been people in the Democratic Party. Uh, who have urged the party to, in effect, write off most of the black vote and indeed the liberal vote. They don't like them, and they just, I mean, a lot of them are conservatives. Many were no doubt enthusiastic about Senator Benson, although, as I say, I don't think Benson's view of his, what he, how he conducts himself in Texas uh, follows that model. I mean, in all fairness. Uh, he's it, not that hardline conservative. You and I haven't been read out of the Texas Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, he's by, more centrist uh, and wants to incorporate. He the understands New Deal political coalition. reality. Uh, yeah. The. Uh, 
But uh, there certainly are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who have essentially urged the party. Uh, I mean, this makes no sense in terms of an electoral model of politics, because the other party should be able to just leapfrog you and go back to that vast 40 or 50 percent of the population you're ignoring. But if you think politics is driven by cash, uh, and then you run an electoral system after sort of setting up your basic uh, sort of cash contributions, financial interests, and power block arrangement, then what you get, you can be absolutely sure the Republican Party is not going to run to your left. So you can effectively, if you want to, and got some estimate of how many votes you'll lose on your left, just move to the right and in effect turn the Democratic Party into a close to a carbon copy of the Republicans uh, and essentially compete with uh, the co for conservative Republican votes. Uh, now, until the Benson uh, selection, I would have said for sure that was probably not what Dukakis was planning to do. Now, I have to say I'm not so sure. Uh, I still believe that common sense as well as his own, you know, a lot of people I know who know him think the guy is uh, quite reasonable. Let's pursue this theme and indicate what the issues of the election are, and starting with your historical point about the right turn in which business abandons the Democrats and goes to the Republicans in the uh, Reagan uh, years, what was the results of the Reagan years for big business, and what is the position of business now vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats and the Republicans? Let's go through a little of the history okay. leading up well, to the elections oh, right. and some of the issues as they emerge. Well, as, as we, you know, we stra say straightforwardly in right turn, and I think common sense will mm -hmm. tell you this, is that it's very clear that, say, in 1981, uh, the bulk of the American business community was certainly lined up behind Reagan. This right. is not news. What is interesting, and if you want to understand the world since then, you have to come to grips with, is the right. fact that Reagan then did not run. You, you can't treat Reagan as simply, or Reaganism, as a sort of uh, expression of sort of the entire business community in alliance against the rest of the population. You're not going to get anywhere with that model. Uh, as we said in our right turn, very quickly when the issue, I mean, the, the the tax issue was perfect for this kind of a coalition because it involved sending money to everybody, uh, especially to people who were rich. In that sense, you're not going to find it break up over that. But as soon as they faced the question, what the tax, the enormous tax cut opened the way for a huge budget deficit. Right. Uh, and then when they went to get offsetting expenditures, the business community divided. The real estate people walked out, and the investment bankers and chunks of the insurance industry began to gang up on them uh, for letting the deficit grow so much. I mean, these are the buyers and sellers of long-term bonds. So yeah. some of the significant parts of the yeah. business community move away from yeah. Reagan. And then uh, what the, when the administration, uh, initially, they, they let the dollar go way up trying to drive inflation out of the system. And that was extremely lucrative, not uh, for a whole bunch of people who used the opportunity, especially in manufacturing, to get rid of a lot of workers. I mean, like the auto companies got rid of th thousands of workers. And you probably couldn't have done that except in a huge recession. Uh, and uh, so for a while, even though the, the high interest rate policies were raising the dollar, making it tough to sell abroad, bringing in Japanese goods, and crashing the sort of domestic income, people were the bulk of the business community is quite happy with this. But then you see, uh, as the income loss gets acute, and they, you know, they, their cost reductions won't carry them all the way, they start getting off. Uh, and there are a lot of unhappy people in 1983, or 82, 83, walking around, even talking about the Democrats. Reagan then countered with Star Wars. And then I think the thing you really want to keep your eye on thereafter is the way the American relationship with Japan developed. Uh, because what was ba the sort of the main line, well, all right, this, and Jackson, I think, this is, I, I must say, an issue that is fundamental, and if you don't understand it, A, you will make no progress toward understanding what's happened or what is about to happen, because it, uh, this issue isn't going to go away, and it sits there. The question of what, how, what's the American posture to Japan? And, and maybe the, the easiest way to sort of get into it in a couple minutes is to sort of go through, start from the stuff that's all around now about is the American empire collapsing and are we overextended? The sort of Paul Kennedy book uh, in particular, has, I mean, Paul Kennedy's uh, historical study, The Decline of Empires, there's a great deal of writing about is the American empire past its peak uh, and are we being succeeded by Japan? Well, if you want to understand what the American business community's response to this is, you've got to understand is that many of them are not embarrassed by the imperial comparison. But they think of it exactly the opposite way. A very nice illustration of this implicitly is in the Zbigniew Brzezinski essay in Foreign Affairs not long ago. I mean, their position is, is if the American empire wants to hold together, the problem is not overextension, is that it, is that it must have a position in the new, fast-growing area in the world, which is the Pacific. 
Uh, and for that, they think their relationship with Japan is utterly fundamental. As, as Brzezinski said in his piece there, he can't imagine how you could develop the Pacific except in partnership with Japan. In that sense, a happy relationship between the sort of American multinational firms that want to go into the Pacific uh, and Japan is fundamental. On the other hand, Japan is killing a good chunk of American industry. Uh, I mean, with completely legal competition. I mean, or, well, we can you know, discuss and that. Economic interest in the U.S. to want yeah. to keep Japan the at a distance and to want to well, be tougher. Well, the question it. is incredibly complicated, mm -hmm. and you're not going to get anywhere with a simple approach which says, well, it's the U.S. versus Japan. What mm -hmm. you got to understand is, first of all, many American multinationals respond to this question by simply transferring production abroad, as Jackson said in his campaign. And then they go, they go to Taiwan or to the other parts of Asia. Now, that gives them a big stake in Southeast Asia. You're not, gonna, right. I mean, you're not going anywhere with a program in the American business community that says, let's retract from Southeast Asia. Right. Uh, on the other hand, what these people then do is start exporting uh, to the rest of the world and indeed back into the United States. Uh, indeed, as you, uh, there's some very nice studies even coming out of the National Bureau of Economic Research which essentially say that, uh, well, if you look at sort of the way the U.S. export position has declined in the world, you'll see a fairly you know, significant decline, although a good deal of it's concentrated, say, in earlier than one would have thought. But then when you look at sort of incorporate sort of exports from Southeast Asia and other countries where U.S. firms are there, there's been no decline in U.S. exports as a, if you count those firms over there. Right. It's as entirely the, the domestic uh, issue. Right. Now, and in many cases, some of those firms even export into Japan. Uh, and indeed, you can see the Japanese sometimes when they've now recently tried to, as the Reagan administrations had to put more pressure on them, they sometimes respond by buying more goods from Southeast Asia, a policy which you can't understand unless you understand that in many cases it's the American firms that are pushing the government that are getting their exports bought there. That does them good. It doesn't do the rest of the population much good. Anyway, that's one strand of the relationship. On the other, so you ask yourself, well, then, who's the natural opponents of this policy? And you can see there how, from the standpoint of the general population, in effect, they're asked to sort of pay the fabulous military and foreign policy costs, this overextension, since it's tax dollars that underwrites the military power, uh, the foreign aid, uh, the sort of money for intelligence operations and so forth. This is big, what you might call the imperial overhead. It's, right. it's very costly. Right. Uh, now, the beneficiaries of that are largely American multinationals, who in many cases are exporting jobs out of the United States. Right. All right? That's just fairly, that's just perfectly clear. On the other, so you might ask yourself, well, why would any multinational, or indeed any large firm, then uh, not find this uh, very attractive? Whence all the criticism of Japan? Well, the short answer is, uh, is that while a, a fair number of people just go overseas, uh, some people can't. The high-tech industry is one that, while it moves a lot of assembly overseas, does a lot of product development and things over here, uh, and, or the, the, in, in many cases it's small firms for whatever, they can't move, or they can't move all their production easily fast enough. What the Reagan people had to live with this too. After all, the Republicans are traditionally the party of industry, the party of business, and they've got to have a Japan policy. Right. What they did is they started out, they, they preached free trade, and they then tried to make accommodation with like the most powerful sectors like auto and steel got uh, import quotas. That very quickly turned out not to be enough. And so what they did for a while was protest with the Japanese and try to get them to, they would try a sort of dual policy of trying to get them to open their markets. Right. Uh, and sort of, then they came up with Star Wars. That was the other half of the dual policy. Right. Just looking at it as a scheme to funnel right. cash to high okay. technology industries, right. it was an interesting response. And it's not, I think, an accident that it was announced a few months after the Democrats' industrial policy program. But then what the, after the 84 election, mean, that got them through the 84 election, the combination of general recovery, Star Wars, and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, the Democrats' own imbecilic, all we will do for you is raise, raise your taxes, taxes which we want to come back with, because Mike Dukakis is possibly in the position of now mm -hmm. telling you maybe all he'll do for you is raise taxes. And, and Bush is creeping Mondale as well. Yeah, no, he hasn't yeah. said that yet. He, has, he said he's going to, the question is not a tax mm -hmm. rise. It's clear when you look at, like, the last fall Gallup polls, which I thought were the most interesting ways to ask the question, uh, th does the population want the budget balanced? Yes. How do they want it balanced? It's clear that as a, the majority of the population wants, or some, uh, at least of those with opinions, uh, want it balanced by cutting military spending. Uh, and they basically would like to spend more on social spending. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this is, this is what we said in the first chapter of Right Turn, and it's, it's not news. Even this morning's New York Times, or yesterday's, makes the point again in a survey that, yeah, uh, it does seem the population is 
rather more to the left of the government. They don't quite put it like that, but that's what they're saying. Right. Um, but now let me, uh, that's creeping, creeping Mondaleism is uh, saying all you're going to do with people is raise taxes. You could do the tax issue if you're going to give them something for it, but what you can't do is tell them we're going to raise taxes so we can spend more money abroad to aid American multinationals. That you cannot do <laughs> and expect to win an election. Uh, and that, I think, is, a, is, I mean, I don't think this is in the, it's settled, that's why I think that one wants to watch very carefully how the Dukakis people approach the Jackson people, because the question, I mean, they say they want to hold the line on defense spending, mm -hmm. but they don't want to cut it. What are they planning to do for the population? Uh, I don't think it's probably going to be enough to say, we promise you somehow that we will get you good jobs at good wages. What are you going to do, pull them out of a hat? But let me come back to the Japanese question. Okay. Um, what the Reagan administration did since 84 is essentially it began to spend more and more money in direct subsidies. Uh, not, so, not through Star Wars, but through other programs like the Super Collider program, the Semiconductor program, the Semitech uh, that they set up uh, here in Austin is an example of that. They have, in effect, channeled more and more money to, th I mean, they've met the, the, the sort of Japanese problem by, in, in effect, without Imitate saying so, them. they have built up, they've right. begun to build up the Defense Department, mm -hmm. uh, not so much through Star Wars, which is a separately designated program, mm -hmm. as an effect in American media. They're doing rather more industrial targeting now than they admit. They're trying to respond to the Japanese by a good deal more targeting, and I think with the holy salutary claim, usually, they will usually, the Democrats on this will usually say, uh, we should also like to shift, uh, there is a, a critique of the uses of military, purely military focus in this spending, and a lot of people think they could do better with uh, more civilian spending. Emphasis on... But products that somebody wants to buy, as Jackson said products. so nicely during the campaign, you know, how many of you, you know, own a VCR or something? You know, lots of people raise their hand. Mm -hmm. How many of you own a, an MX missile? You know, right. well, nobody. Well, who wants to buy that? Right. Uh, well, that's, of course, one thing the election is about. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so the Japan question, is, the Democrats definitely embody, uh, a, I'd say, a joint business labor response. Uh, now, I mean, the labor response here is quite, uh, it's probably worth pursuing this. I mean, the J Jackson himself said very powerfully, uh, and I think it's very important that the, the point get made again and again, that one major way the U.S. sort of has lost out in international economic competition uh, is that uh, sort of the American defense budget and foreign aid policies go to regimes in the third world that essentially wipe out independent trade unions. I mean, and in effect, they hold workers' wages down, and they use the resources of the United States, and often the, to do it, to put it simply and bluntly. Indeed, I think you, could, you can generalize this point, uh, which is, is that a huge amount of the American tax problem, uh, the fiscal problem, is about how are you going to divide the costs of empire uh, in the population. And the plain facts are is that a, the, we spend a huge amount of our money and time supporting regimes in the third world that basically make it attractive for businesses from here to move. Right. Uh, and uh, Jackson, I think, did everybody a service in raising that issue, even as much as, for instance, the New York Times quoted unnamed people and one or two people who claimed to be Democrats ridiculing the whole approach to that. Uh, there's nothing crazy about the view, I think, and there's certainly no, there's no economic uh, illogic in saying uh, that a regime that sort of, in, in effect, murders trade unionists who are sort of trying to form reasonable trade unions um, should not get the support of the United States. I think it's a really important question. Is that One thing you can do to sort of restructure the United States economy is stop subsidizing uh, th this indirect form of subsidy uh, out abroad. That's well, the long and the short of it. Some of it's not so much indirect. There are yeah. big tax breaks for uh, yeah. the companies overseas, American companies yeah. overseas. And uh, so it's... <laughs> well, great grants, I mean, yeah. in many cases. Yeah, I, I may add that yeah. another aspect, I think, of Jackson's campaign that uh, it was extremely interesting is the way that point was developed. The Jackson campaign just says, look, you've got, if you stop holding down workers' wages abroad, uh, and indeed join in sort of general uh, efforts to sort of reflate the rest of the world, uh, you can develop the United States and not at the expense of the rest of the world. And that's this is unfortunately Jackson's position, which is a minority uh, one here. What's the difference exactly between the Democrats and the Republicans? Essentially, what the Bush people are talking is, th I mean, they are doing more industrial targeting under the guise of defense spending. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, they're continuing to talk what I think is fairly traditional free trade, mm -hmm. trying to pressure the Japanese. Uh, to sort of uh, do more military spending, to uh, spend more of their trade surpluses
resources on foreign aid, and they're all eventually they help, look, uh, they're also looking for a third world bank bailout. Uh, they are certainly got their eyes fixed, I think, first on the Pacific. Uh, the, the Dukakis people, on the other hand, uh, partly because of those, tr you know, the, the plain solid trade question, which you can't get around from, and which forms, forms the perfect flying buttress between a chunk of American industry and a chunk of the American labor movement, mm -hmm. the AFL-CIO, which would love to block out Japanese goods, mm -hmm. uh, the or most of the most of the unions would. Um, they do seem to be uh, rather less interested in Japan, partially for that, and spending somewhat more interested in NATO and European. Uh, concerns. I mean, they are well aware, I think, of a fact which is, I think, shortly to destabilize American politics again, and which, in my opinion, will help shape its sort of long-run fundamental problems uh, a great deal, which uh, I think probably in a way that squeezes the domestic population, which is very simply this, is by 1992, the European economic community has to merge its... Um, uh, its financial uh, rules, and they're going to have open capital mobility, and in general, one market, at least that's their aim. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're likely to do that. They're in mm -hmm. effect, while that's not a United States of Europe, it's a major step toward it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that, as they do that, that's going to stimulate tremendous economic competition for a lot of people who've never had it. Well, you can see when foreign, foreign firms have been coming into the U.S., you can all argue about whether that's good or bad, but the plain fact is a lot of people don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, even in this country, which has, uh, you know, is basically an enormously open market mm -hmm. uh, in financial terms, there's a lot of pressure to close it. The same thing is true in Europe. Why won't European cl Europeans close it? The answer is because the U.S. will do them services, like pay for their defense, for example. Uh, I mean, again, the military and foreign aid budget is going to be used to subsidize American firms doing business in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the question is, who's going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. They are mostly not going to be charged for that, mm -hmm. in the sense that what the Reagan tax programs mm -hmm. meant is that you're going to throw more and more of the tax burden. Mm -hmm. uh, the net effect of that is certainly to throw the tax burden on the poor and the middle classes. Uh, now, then, what's going to happen? Because in effect, I mean, the, the, right now the line uh, in, among all the U.S. business groups mm -hmm. is we have to retrench. We must make the allies pay more. Mm -hmm. the, the, what's going to happen when they don't? <laughs> uh, or when they move, they, I mean, they will do something, obviously, but they then the will, U.S. They will, has to keep uh, paying the deficit uh, grows, and so tax pressures. Are well, the, the all, key, key to this, it seems to me, is that, in fact, they are paying for our... Uh, for our military because it's the Europeans and the Japanese who by and large are buying uh, holding the American debt. Well, that's that's correct. But you got a problem here in that it's hard to think of any earthly reason given the sort of present condition of the Soviet Union why anybody in Europe is really going to want to pay more for defense. I mean, the, it's surely the case that their chances of being invaded in Europe have never been less in the post-war right. period than they are now. And it's very hard for me to imagine how the population in America can be persuaded to sort of go to inferior schools, uh, sort of have a worse social welfare system, uh, generally have sort of more poor and meager lives in order to sort of build up uh, sort of the American contribution to European defenses mm -hmm. uh, without the threat of sort of world communism. I, mean, I think how the uh, parties play mm -hmm. uh, Gorbachev is very important. and. There, now th let me just swing to the question you asked, how's okay. Bush playing right. this? Well, right. we know what the Reagan administration did. Right. I think initially motivated in part by the sheer fact that once Gorbachev said he wants to deal, mm -hmm. the West Germans uh, were very clearly willing to deal, and were going to deal whether the United States did it or not. Right. Now Bush, now I, in one of my things that came to light in my campaign finance study, is that in many parts of the defense industry are anxious as can be uh, about detente. There is a powerful anti-detente block, and it's interesting to see that Bush, in his uh, campaign, has moved very much against the Reagan policy in the last couple of months. In other words, after Dole folded, he sort of took over some of the issue there. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what will Dukakis do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you will get, I mean, at the moment, uh, he's sort of saying, well, some people are telling me that Gorbachev is sincere. I saw him, I saw him said that the other day. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the main lines coming out of his advisors are, it would be folly to negotiate rapidly with the Soviet Union. And it's true. You could make a stupid deal uh, that would, uh, I mean, there are any number of ways these things can miscarry. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that they could make an agreement fairly rapidly if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do they want to? The trouble is, if you do that, I don't know how you persuade the population to sort of spend all the cash on, on, on overseas, military and foreign aid, uh, the sort of whole question of the American empire. I really think there is a fundamental issue here, mm -hmm. uh, is that you have got to have a large chunk of the population just sit there and believe that they are going to be swept away by the red tide at the first sign uh, of any sort of... Uh, uh, you know, if the, if the Navy dropped to, say, 500 ships instead of 550. Well, this, this was something that was, uh, yeah. that, uh, was brought home, as I've read about uh, Truman, that he was saying that they were going to have these big commitments to Europe and all, and some the, advisors there said, is the only no way to do that is you're going to have to scare the hell out of the, out of the American people, and they decided to scare the hell out of yeah. the American people to justify yeah. all this expense with the red... I don't think uh, there is uh, any question <laughs> that a number of people... Uh, in the Truman administration, now that the, the the documents have recently come out on some of the things on the background papers to the NSC 68 uh, and uh, the, some of the other uh, sort of major foreign policy pronouncements there, we're perfectly well trying to crank up the domestic pol uh, economics of the United States by using international arguments, uh, international foreign policy arguments to do it. I think that's exactly right. Well, the question I have for the election is, what will the position of, say, Bush and Dukakis be vis-a-vis -vis Gorbachev and the Soviet Soviet Union. Obviously, the Reagan administration did the biggest defense buildup in history. The defense industry is half the In be absolute, not percentage terms, yeah. Be yeah behind yeah, yeah. Uh, Reagan, the Bush, the Republicans, 100%. Bush has also indicated he's going to keep a high level of defense spending. Um, well, but, all right. Uh, what so I, there's a sector of industry very and tricky. policy that's going to be sharply Republican. Now, Dukakis, on the other hand, is saying he wants to cut back on defense spending. It's not what he's saying. Well, we look again. Yeah, yeah. Well, what he's actually saying is he, d he wants to sort of, okay. he does not want to chop it any further, mm -hmm. and he wants to hold uh, defense spending roughly constant. Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of interesting to follow. It's clear that if you abstract from what the Reagan administration is saying, I don't mean Bush now, but the Reagan administration, the policy that Carlucci is actually following on military spending, which is uh, sort of try to hold steady, is very close to what Dukakis is talking. I have to add, too, that I think the budget pressures in the next administration would make it difficult even for Bush to increase military spending. I think you're looking at uh, both parties, I think, may be converging on not something the population wants. The population clearly wants the budget cut the defense budget right. cut. I think that is just, you, I don't know how you can escape that conclusion right. when you look at, for instance, the Gallup polls and so forth, even when you give them choices. Uh, but they want to hold it even. Uh, and then the interesting question is, where do you go to get new money for programs? I think the Republicans won't do many new programs. The Democrats have a bigger problem. Now, this brings us to the tax question and to the sort of heart of some of the interesting economics uh, of the Dukakis administration. I, I don't think they've shown their hand. They're open on this question in the sense that the future is open. Much of it is couched in the discussion of we have to get the like savings rate up. Taxes. Now, <laughs> let's just talk about that for a minute because this is the fraud in your future, uh, the savings rate question. The, see, the, one starts out with you know scare figures that usually pit the U.S. personal rate of saving, not the sort of total rate which include corporate savings and pen, but the personal rate uh, against the sort of full Japanese figure, and then you are urged to believe that there's some ironclad link between uh, sort of economic growth and uh, total savings, because that's linked to total investment. In the end, what they'd like to do is have you buy less uh, and uh, export more uh, and get and cut government spending a substantial and amount. less, too. Thus. Uh, yeah. We import less and export more. I'm right. sorry. Maybe I didn't make that yet. It's the net right. balance. Right. Export more. Right. Uh, and it, it's, it's simply deficit reduction. It is not different, basically, from what Mondale was talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the interesting question is whether they'll go ahead with it. There's a lot of people, there are some people around Dukakis that are cautioning them about this, just telling them, you know, why would anyone vote for this? Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen when you do it? I don't know. Uh, the, the, the United States does not need another bout of austerity. If the Democrats bring another bout of austerity, I think the key point to sort of understand here is that you're not going to have to worry about the, the memory of Franklin Roosevelt. You're going to have to worry about the specter of Grover Cleveland, but what is uh, the guy who wrecked the Democratic <laughs> Party for a generation with his right. response to a populist movement in 1894. Well, what about Bush and the Republicans? Bush talked about voodoo economics. Um, Bush is going to do exactly Reagan's the same supply what? side thing. But Bush is saying the same yeah. thing. He's saying, look, we got these big deficits. We got to get them down. We got to keep military spending up. Yeah. And we don't want to raise taxes. He would like to, the difference is that economics. Bush would like to chop social spending a good deal more. 
I think I think he will so much already. Can really always well, well when the they talk about when you look at no what return. they say, it's yeah. that uh, the Republican line repeated by Bosk and repeated by Bush is we got to get at entitlements. Read Social but there's, Security. There's not that much to chop away. Well, I mean, it seems that Reagan went about as far as he could. Not true. You yeah. could chop. Look, you're still yeah. getting. You know, my, my mother is still getting yeah. her Social Security check. That <laughs> well, check could either be eliminated or reduced. Politicians have seen that that's something that can't be tampered with. That was a, a lesson Reagan learned early I on. I hope you're right, but when, when George was, Bush says he'll never, never, never raise your taxes, that means he's and, he's, get your and he wants security. to cut the deficit, what does he mean by yeah. that? Tom, we've talked a lot about the big issues in the election, some of the historical background, the economic forces, the different candidates, and their programs. Where does this leave us now as we look at the future of American politics? What would be a better road, say, for the Democratic Party to take as they move into the election and then into the next uh, regime? Well, let's, the question about a well, better road, let, let's just take it almost from a clinical standpoint for a minute, uh, which will then very quickly lead to a consideration of what, they are, what in some sense would be better policy for the vast majority of right. us. Uh, this is the, I, I think the really key question here is how the Jackson movement fits into the Democratic Party. Okay. Uh, and here I, you have to sort of deal with a number of facts. First, it is, it is plainly true mm -hmm. that the sort of left or liberal uh, sort of voting population of the Democratic Party is larger than the Jackson. In that sense, the Jackson right. is a lower bound estimate of that. Because right. there are very clearly people who don't agree with them on other issues, uh, especially the Middle East one, which certainly right. created a lot of turmoil in the campaign. In that sense, yeah. you're actually looking at a substantial... I mean, I, I think it's clearly the case that uh, candidates in the future who want to take a flyer in the party in a national campaign and run on, including maybe Jackson himself again, mm -hmm. uh, could conceivably win. So let's focus then on the Jackson campaign right. and the Jackson phenomenon and what yeah. impact okay. will continue to well, have. It's, it's worth thinking about this a fair amount because one line was, uh, I mean, the, one thing you have to settle up in your mind is, did is it true that he had no uh, media support and did he do this all without the media or not? They're basically and without money. Yeah, and there are basically two lines here. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jackson people complain, I think, with a good deal of justice. Somebody has shown, for example. Uh, a nice comparison that Reagan had plenty of openly racist comments in his past record that you could show on TV. They didn't right. cut to those in, right. t in 1980 uh, when he was running for president, uh, although people were always cutting back to the Farrakhan remarks uh, in uh, the Jackson campaign. In the Jaime town, New yeah. York. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's one. On the other hand, it's also true, I think, uh, and there are some evidence to suggest that Jackson got a lot of sort of uh, favorable comment. There's one little institute in Washington that claims he got quite favorable treatment. Now it turns out when you look at what they mean by favorable treatment, they mean simply uh, somebody saying anything good about him at all, and then they admit in the next breath that, well, there were no issues discussed. Well, how do you discuss Jesse Jackson without issues? Well, you know, there I think there was some suggestion, well, he's black, uh, it would be nice to have a black run for president for a while, plus it was a sensitive issue, and he may have benefited for a while. There's no question that when Jackson got close, after he destroyed Dukakis in Michigan, uh, that the media turned on him, and he was vicious. certainly vicious, vicious, and it was one of the worst, most outrageously unfair uh, press campaigns anybody will ever see. Now, and this even brings us the liberal media too, like NPR and all those people, and uh, they were all I, 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 almost without yeah, almost without time. exception. Now, this brings us to a really important point. Okay. Part of that campaign was a uh, Washington Post ABC poll, which came out in a story in the Post then was widely ventilated, which claimed that Jackson had not brought in any new voters. Now, when I read that, and that became quickly the official line. I was in, when I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, well, you didn't bring in any new voters. Well, and when was this? When was this? Oh, it escapes me now. Uh, you'll have to check back the, w exactly what day that story came out. When this came out, I said to myself, there's something wrong. Uh, so I called up first the Post and then ABC, where I would have to say were two of the rudest conversations I've ever had. They were extremely upset and would not, more to the point, I asked them, I said, look, you know, I, I, I would like to check this. Could I see? I had a hunch as to what was wrong at that point. Mm -hmm. I said, could I see your poll? No, I couldn't see the poll. Now, that's pretty outrageous. Uh, I think it's just a scandal when a major network and a major newspaper will not release to reasonably qualified uh, people their poll. I mean, you can't do uh, things like that in a sort of uh, reasonably honest uh, system. At any rate, I then very the, the LA Times people very kindly made available to me a poll. Uh, and then after I looked at that for a while, it was pretty easy to see what was going on, which is this, is that 
we know there have been some, several excellent vote validation studies. It turns out when you ask people, did you vote in the last election, they are often, about 25% of them will often say they did, uh, when in fact they didn't. Uh, now, what the Ab when you read the story of the Post, you know, since I don't know exactly what they did, since they wouldn't ta tell me, uh, I don't feel. But it's clear they didn't make that correction. Uh, Instead, what they did is they tried to estimate the percentage of people who really voted just using their self-report of voting. But that was too high. Right. In other words, so a lot of those people who said they voted that they didn't vote. That's right. A lot of those people who said they voted did uh, not. And uh, then, of course, that's that. There you go. Right. Uh, now, when you try to find a direct measure of what did Jackson actually do, there, there is a question that is a very good one on the L.A. Times poll. And there, of the people who said they didn't vote, mm -hmm. you know, which is you know, that too has report problems. But right. you know, if, they, if they're willing to say they didn't vote, it's much right. more likely they didn't. Right. Right. Um, of those people who said they didn't vote in the New York primary, where the turnout was incidentally enormous, uh, much higher than in a, the uh, than in, uh, 84 or 80, the uh, or 84. I didn't check the 80 figures, but I'm sure. Right. Uh, uh, and, at any rate, there something like 64 percent of those people who said they didn't vote said they voted for Jackson. Uh, I don't think there's any question that as long as it seemed this guy had a reasonable chance to win at all, and indeed even before that, in the sense that Wisconsin had a high, relatively high turnout, uh, and so, the, some southern states did, others had normal turnouts, and then people are fighting as to whether it was the Democrats or Republicans who turned out. It's very clear Jackson did probably bring in new voters. Claims by the, you know, the major media, ABC, uh, Washington Post stuff, that he didn't is I, I don't think there's any it's warrant for that at all. It's very clear that the whole question of voter registration, the Democratic Party has so far largely walked away from it. Uh, and uh, you know, I think if the Dukakis administration is serious about being an inclusive administration, I think you should watch very closely their response to that. See, very conservative closely. Democrats do not want a big voter uh, registration turnout because that means the more radical candidates, the more left candidates at least. I think there's will, no doubt that will, they uh, are exactly, that that is precisely what worries them. Well, right. you, you made that point in right turn on our program yeah. previously, yeah. that the rich people who support the, the Democrats are uh, much better served if a conservative, if the uh, they would conservative... Lose, they would lose by winning if they won with a, with a fully mobilized electorate. Yeah, yeah. they'd much yeah. rather have... Uh, yeah. The conservative Democrats much rather have Reagan yeah. than, uh, than they yeah. would their own. I, I, but but on the other hand, we know, and Michael Dukakis knows, and all the big Democratic leaders know, that Jackson did bring in a lot of people, I, and they I, need I, those I people for the election if they want to win. So that means there's got to be some accommodation by the Democrats. I hope, and, Jackson, and there's and there are certainly big incentives on so this, particularly the with the Supreme Court. Well, uh, you got the Supreme Court appointments to be made. Uh, and you got a judiciary uh, that is uh, that almost destroyed during yeah, the Reagan yeah. years with all these right-wing appointments. It's you, it, I think that and the, the Republican administration's recent moves on civil rights have been just outrageous. Right. I mean, in terms of trying to roll back some of the legal right. protections there. To so in that sense, scandals, I wouldn't suggest people take that. a walk. Right. I do think though that people it would be helpful to think. I I do mm -hmm. believe that if if the if, as I hope he doesn't, the Dukakis administration takes a conservative course, uh, as I, but if he does it, then I would expect uh, a sort of real brittle administration. And I mm -hmm. think you'll probably find that the first time they get a shock, they'll find themselves without much public support. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'd have to look for sort of a mid-course correction or mid-term uh, sort of reassembly of the coalition, Unless which you might get a better Unless he builds up something of a New Deal yeah. coalition, which would include the Jackson forces yeah. as his... Uh, support and then he would have to give them social programs, cut back on military spending, have um, a policy that incorporates traditional New Deal issues. Yeah, and it's not clear Dukakis wants to do this, so it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, like I said, the choice for the Democrats in 1988 is between Roosevelt and Grover Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> now we have time for some news stories from the Alternative Press. Mainstream economists have been telling us, and of course the media also, that, hey, it's a good thing that the U.S. dollar is falling because it's going to make U.S. products cheaper. Therefore, people will want to import these products, and so we'll have more exports, and our balance of payments will get better, and we'll have more jobs, and people will be working. Well, how is it working? Joy Jones of the uh, uh, Associated Press had a 
article in which she said, well, it isn't such good news because the United States under Reaganomics and uh, the Democrats before that have so de-industrialized the United States economy that it can't respond to any new demand from overseas. There have been troublesome shortages of material and labor popping up all across the country and in a wide range of industries from chemical to paper to personal computers. And so the, right now the American factories are just incapable of both increasing exports and replacing imported goods with, with one made at home. They can't do it. In addition to this, there's not enough money around for any investment to build new plants. That's another problem. So much money is just floating around going to uh, just pure speculation and playing around with the stock market and with the dollar and to try to take over other companies that nothing is going into building new plants so they can take advantage of this. Another feature is that American workers are no longer trained and skilled like they used to be. With the deindustrialization that's been going on, the workers just they're just hired for service jobs, and they don't know anything about any of the high-tech stuff that the foreigners would, would demand. In short, uh, Joy Jones says the U.S. economy is structured to be a giant vacuum cleaner for imported products, and a simple decline in the value of dollar will not change overnight. And I saw another article which said, in addition to this, the plant uh, managers and the people who run the corporations say, well, the dollar may go up, so why should we invest so much in uh, new plants to try to export? <laughs> so much for classical economics. Hmm. Well, there's quite an interesting story in, in these times this week about dissident scientists battling the AIDS dogmas. Previously in the media, the HIV virus was called the AIDS virus, that supposedly people that had this virus were the highest risk factors for actually contracting AIDS, and it was even claimed by some scientists the HIV virus is simply the cause, the actual uh, producer of uh, the AIDS uh, syndrome. Well, according to scientists, some dissident scientists, this is all uh, nonsense. They argue that the so-called HIV virus does not necessarily lead to AIDS. It's not necessarily the uh, virus that causes AIDS and that there's really no scientific evidence that will stand up to make these claims. According to one recent scientific survey, only a small percentage of those testing positive for the HIV virus actually have AIDS. Moreover, a University of, Sci of California scientist, Dr. Peter Duisberg, who's a professor of retrovirology, claims that there's no scientific evidence whatsoever to equate the HIV virus with um, AIDS. In the November 1987 issue of Biotechnology, Duisberg argues that three criteria need to be met before a virus can said to be pathogenic. First of all, it must be biochemically active. It must infect or intoxicate more cells than the host can regenerate or spare. And the host must be genetically and immunologically permissive. According to uh, Dersberg, the HIV virus doesn't meet any of those criteria. He says that HIV is latent and inactive, not only in those who test positive for the antibody to the virus, but also in the 10,000 annually who develop um, AIDS, that the HIV is an inactive virus within uh, both AIDS patients and in uh, people who uh, have the virus but uh, do not have uh, AIDS. According to uh, Duisberg, HIV actively infects fewer than 0.01% of susceptible white uh, blood cells, while 5% of these same cells are regenerated during the two days that it takes the virus to infect the uh, cell. So that the uh, conclusion that he draws is that this is uh, not the uh, cause of AIDS, and he claims, moreover, that a few government scientists have perpetuated the myth that HIV is the AIDS uh, virus, basically to bolster their egos and their uh, careers. The Supreme Court has done some real weird things, and much of it bad, but they have, in one instance, they've done great harm to civil liberties, like in approving uh, preventive detention, but in another uh, case, 
uh, back in uh, 1987, according to Jack Landau and the New House News Service, the Supreme Court came out and said that uh, you can verbally abuse a police officer. How about that? Even to the extent of using uh, epithets. You know, those bleep words that you can't hear normally? So long as you restrain yourself and uh, don't uh, do any physical obstruction in the uh, carrying on of any police activity. Well, that hadn't been in the case with Houston for the last 30 years. Remember back in the 60s and 70s, a lot of uh, cities uh, passed ordinances where you couldn't say oink, oink when the cops went by? Well, they were putting in jail, people in jail for doing that. Well, in Houston, about a thousand people a year had been uh, being, were being arrested for arguing too harshly with the police. But the Supreme Court knocked it down. Now, this ordinance in Houston said that it was a crime to verbally oppose any policeman in the performance of his duties. You couldn't uh, challenge or argue with, the, with him, uh, I mean, much less yell and scream or insult. Well, the Supreme Court said the law was so vague that it uh, gave the police almost unlimited jurisdiction and discretion in making arrests. And the, uh, edit, the uh, writer of the story, Jack Landau, says, as far as good old-fashioned police kibitzers, nosy sidewalk superintendents, and hot-tempered arrestees, the Supreme Court has said to the police, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the uniform. Data in the Environmental Protection Agency shows that on the average, Florida grapefruit contains a level of lead 17 times higher than the EPA's proposed new lead in drinking water standard. According to Jay Feldman at the National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides, the levels in grapefruit of lead are particularly dangerous, and they're con especially concerned about the dangers of brain damage, uh, and birth defects to unborn children on pregnant women and the dangers of people that are chronic dieters who are dieting on uh, grapefruit might sustain to their physiology from the high uh, lead uh, intake. The good news is that this new, that this lead arsenate compound has been uh, banned and is no longer being produced. The bad news is that there's still enough on hand for two more years of use and the Reagan administration has still not forbidden its actual use, so it could be used for two more uh, years on uh, grapefruit. The uh, little newspaper, news magazine uh, extra of the fairness and accuracy in reporting talks about a very, just one news story with Dan Rather and Bert Quint on the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather comes in and says, uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization put on what to be appeared a show of uh, unity today in Algiers. Bert Quint reports that the show was orchestrated by Moscow. Well, Bert Quint said, uh, Soviet attempts to bring Palestinian leaders together paid off today when blah, 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 and then there was a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. The Soviet Union was working quietly to strengthen the PLO and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so the story had four references of the Soviets, four references in four sentences. And of course, Soviet puppetry is the center stage for the Palestinian stories, for Nicaraguans, black South Africans, etc. So the people from Extra magazine questioned CBS about it. They questioned their senior producer and uh, said, well, hey, how do they know? the Soviet Union was orchestrating all this. And Richard Cohen from CBS said, well, <clears throat> attribution isn't necessary since a veteran reporter based his story on his observations on the ground. So when the pressed further, Cohen re conceded, well, maybe orchestrated might have been ill-chosen. But nonetheless, as the Bush people said when somebody said, hey, you, th what you said on TV was an absolute lie. And they said, yeah, we know it, but 50 million people saw it, and they won't know any different. Hmm. And that concludes Alternative Views for this time. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye. Spend an afternoon with a night in Camelot.